to call the meeting to order. Yes. Welcome everybody. Could please stand and let's say the pledge of allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for invocation, uh, Reverend Randy Stone. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to give thanks. We want to give thanks for the place in which we live. Thankful, Lord, for all the wonderful things that we enjoy from day to day. And Lord, we trust that we do not take them for granted. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful beauty, for the trees that we enjoy. Lord, I've seen mountains and other places without trees upon them. And there's a world of difference. And Lord, we thank you for the water that we have, so much of it. We're just grateful for how you've provided for this valley and for the needs that it has. We thank you, Lord, for the human resources that we have in this valley, for the men and women who get up each day and go and work hard to provide for their families and for their neighbors. And Father, we thank you for the men and women who work for the town of Black Mountain. We ask you, Lord, to bless them as they work diligently to keep us safe in every way. And Father, we thank you for these who are on our board. We are grateful, Lord, for their dedication and their desire. We realize that they must have a great desire, a great burden to see good for this valley, or they would not give their time, their effort uh, for this cause. We realize that many times their job is a thankless one, that folks are not always appreciative of what is done. But we thank you, Lord, for their diligence and their determination. We ask you, Lord, to give them wisdom. You have said that if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. And Father, we pray that you would bless all of us liberally with the wisdom that is from heaven, the one that brings about peace. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless in this meeting tonight, that it might be productive, and that it might be one in the end that we can all rejoice in and feel good about. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend All right, first on the agenda tonight are a couple of proclamations. Uh, the first one here will be uh, the one honoring Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. inspired millions of Americans to participate in nonviolent protests to support the ideals of equality for all and was a motivating force behind a civil rights movement that has had as its goal the creation of a, so a society tolerant of all races, cultures, and nationalities. And whereas the ideals of Dr. King and of Black Mountain's commitment to human rights are worthy of reflection and serve as a reminder that improving the quality of life for all members of our community is a responsibility of every citizen. And whereas the celebration of Dr. King's birthday is intended as a time for all Americans to reaffirm the commitment to the basic principles that underlie our Constitution, equality, and justice for all, and whereas the town of Black Mountain encourages all citizens to rededicate themselves to the principles of respect for human rights and freedom, of belief in nonviolence, and a commitment to improving our community through community service and volunteerism. Now, therefore, I see Michael Sobel Mayor of the Town of Black Mountain, on behalf of the Board of Aldermen, the citizens of Black Mountain, wish to honor and do hereby proclaim Monday, January the 13th, 2014, as Dr. Martin Luther King Day. The Town of Black Mountain will honor Dr. Martin Luther King at the 24th Annual Swannanoa Valley Prayer Breakfast, Saturday, February 1st, at 9 o'clock, hosted by local official, uh, the local Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Corporation. Uh, each year, scholarships are awarded to the local recipients who have uh, applied and made it through the selection process. The challenge that the scholarship pose include critical thinking and compassionate actions. Signed this 13th day, January the, of 2014. The second proclamation will be for honoring Mercina Jimmy Pananas McSwain. And whereas Mercina, Jimmy to all of us. Pananas McSwain was born in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania on October 14, 1922. And whereas her parents were born in Matilini, Lesbos, 
Greece, and in 1938, the family moved to Upper Strasburg, Pennsylvania, where they enjoyed living on their farm for 14 years, whereas Mr. and Ms. Pananas owned the Olympia Candy Company in Chambersburg, which is still in the Pananas family, and whereas Jimmy, as her early family and friends called her, graduated from the John Hopkins School of Nursing in the U.S. Cadet Nurse Corps, where she worked in the blood bank through the polio ec academic. And whereas as, as part of Jimmy's training at John Hopkins, she had to work a year at the Veterans Hospital in Oteen, where she met and later married Ray o Odell, Odell McSwain and moved to Black Mountain with a winter home in Bradenton, Florida. And whereas Jimmy and her husband Mac raised money to pave the first tennis courts in Black Mountain in 1953 and later had a beautiful stone water fountain built beside the courts, she organized the first annual tennis tournament Owen in 1976, and whereas Jimmy in 1933, and whereas in 1983, Jimmy was the first president of the newly formed Black Mountain Tennis Association. Because of her teaching children and adults the game of tennis, she earned the name Godmother of Tennis. And whereas Jimmy was very active in the senior games and went to the nationals twice, she could be seen walking around Lake Tomahawk, working in her yard, playing bridge, mahjong, and poker when not playing tennis. And whereas Jimmy being a breast cancer survivor, she was the epitome of living life to the fullest and was an inspiration to all. Now, therefore, I see Michael Sobel, Mayor of Pinal Black Mountain, on behalf of the Board of Alderman and the citizens wish to honor and to hereby proclaim Monday, January 13th as Mercina Jimmy Pananas McSwain Day. Signed this 13th today, 2014. Yes, if we all could live life like Jimmy McSwain did, this world would be a whole lot better place. We've got two people signed up for citizens' comments, but they are on the program for communications from boards. So I, the three ladies from FHA, do you, did you wish to speak? Ms. Fisher, did, did they wish to speak beforehand? Okay. And then uh, Phil Bassessi? No, sir. Okay. All right. Fine. Then. All right. Communications from the board. Uh, Urban Forestry Commission reporting on downtown planters. Our own Mr. Van Burnett. Hey, folks. Haven't seen y'all all year. Doesn't seem like that long ago, does it? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we're going to talk about Urban Forestry Commission would like to address the, the issue of the trees in downtown Black Mountain. Uh, that's all right. I've got a, a, a powerless point uh, presentation here. Uh, over the years, there's been little, uh, if any, consideration given to the trees that have been planted and those that have been established in the downtown area. Uh, that particular area I will be dressing, uh, addressing today are the sidewalks uh, extending on State Street from Richardson Boulevard to Cherry, uh, Church Street, uh, Cherry Street, and Broadway. It doesn't mean that there are uh, other areas to be considered, but uh, these are our most publicly viewed streets and that have some of the specific problems that I'll be talking about right here. And these problems are that the trees have been starved for water over the years. Uh, there's no root aeration. There's been no fertilization as far as I, I'm, I'm aware of. Irregular and destructive pruning, uh, surface scarring of the tree bases, uh, growth into the awnings and power lines, and uh, really they show no uniformity of species that would create a more consistent theme for downtown. Uh, yeah, well, that that first slide, um, back up this one, yeah, that that's like, <clears throat> this is an example of, of the surface scarring and and like there's there's more bark on a toy poodle than this on this tree right here. Uh, uh, so you get a, you get a lot of you get a lot of destructive stuff, especially when trees are on the ground like that. Uh, if there's weed eaters involved or uh, a lot of dogs passing by, there's there's a lot of problems that trees on the ground like this present. 
Now, what we're re recommending, uh, well, the other slides too, uh, that's just showing some of the, the puny uh, trees that, that are planted and kind of showing the trees that are, you know, sharing spaces with signs and are right close to the road and, and growing basically in toward the road. Now, what we're recommending to the town is consider bringing more beauty, functionality, and uniformity to our town by incorporating sidewalk planters with trees, native preferred, uh, that are selected to withstand the pressures of growing in confined space of the container and everyday stresses of the town environment. Slides next. Now, uh, we're not exactly talking about old forts planters, as we can see right here. We're hoping to do a little bit better and uh, 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 go up to something bigger such as these. These are actually called barrier planters. These planters are three feet wide. They're six feet, eight feet long. Uh, and they are uh, three feet deep. Now, this actually allows, uh, in a planter, there are some situations that, that, we'll, that I'll talk about later, but overall that would be enough soil to generate uh, a tree growth as long as we're, we're in the small tree category, which we'll we be looking at. Uh, these planters would be uh, filled with soil substrate suitable for trees and portable to some extent if they had to be removed from maintenance or relocation. Uh, the exteriors of these planters would match the trash cans if you look at this planter right here, for example, in our trash cans, uh, that's called a pebble dash, or, or uh, that's that's an old old style term for that that type of uh, uh, rock work on the outside of the trash can. So we're trying to match up, so we don't have to buy new trash can things here. We're actually, if we go to this route, then then we'll have a pretty good match uh, to that uh, existing trash cans, not the one beside it. I'm not exactly sure how, I think that's, is that recycled? Yeah, yeah that's recycled. Yeah. Uh, let's see here, uh, the ex, let's see, and uh, now the other thing too is that uh, what we are, what are, what are the areas that we're considering for these planters? Uh, the first area is along State Street at the town square. Now that is already, there has already been talk about using planters here according to John DeWitt with the Town Square project. That's a shot right there at the bottom of, or looking up uh, with the Town Square on the right. These sidewalks, we have, uh, we've taken all the dimensions of these sidewalks in three feet. Uh, we, we decided to go with three feet wide uh, planters because the dimensions of the sidewalks are the most narrow are six feet. That still gives us three feet of space for the ADA um, uh, uh, requirements for wheelchair accessibility and that kind of thing on a, on a public sidewalk. This is the shot taken down, uh, looking back down that way with the town square on the left. Uh, Cherry Street with uh, parallel parking and narrow sidewalks, uh, which is, uh, hmm, anyway, um, that's uh, not Cherry Street. It, yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, with parallel uh, parking and narrow sidewalks uh, does present a little bit of problems, uh, but we would have room to allow for the ADA standards. And if the planters were spa or spaced right in between where the line is dividing the two sidewalks, even at eight feet, it would still be allow enough for the doors of any vehicle to open up. Um, Sutton Avenue, well, um, there's a possibility here that we may not be able to get uh, planters right here um, because of the fact that we got low windows right here and uh, we do have a lot of trees right across the street. Um, that's just the, that it, there is a possibility we could do it right there. Um, the north side of Broadway has some limitations as well. Uh, we have benches, newspaper stands, and the angled parking. Uh, but everything could be accomplished if we if we do this uh, in the right way. Uh, the south side of uh, State Street between Broadway and Cherry Street is a wide area with existing trees that are in bad shape, 
but would be a good location for planters. Um, uh, like that's right in front of Brandon's, I think, right there. The trees that are planted there, uh, we've already had to pull up at least one of them. And uh, <clears throat> they're, they're actually in pretty, pretty bad shape. Once we get a little further uh, east on, on State Street, the trees are pretty well established and, and they, look, they look good enough to where I don't think we need to mess with them. Um, <clears throat> this, the north side of State Street, yeah, this uh, is just uh, right across the street from where we just looked, presents another problem in the use of, there's a lot of awnings that are out here, overhead power lines and parallel parking, uh, as in the case of Cherry Street, the east side of Broadway. Well, these awnings, there's a good shot right there, just to the power lines and, and the awning situations. But uh, uh, there, there are ways, and I'm not going to, devil into those too much right now, but there are ways that we can put these planters in. They're going to already going to be three feet off the ground to begin with and with proper pruning and, and taking care of them. Everything, any space could work to, uh, in order to use the planter. Um, so, uh, but there, with the proper care and, and selection of a few uniform species, and we're looking at uniform species and, and, and Put, trying to put this whole thing together and just using two or three species of trees downtown and not a whole wide array of, of mismatched uh, type of trees. And with, pro, pro, uh, with the uh, uh, regular maintenance of their growth in the downtown area, I think could be greatly uh, enhanced aesthetically with the introduction of new trees in the downtown area. So um, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Now, I'm sure you have a question or two about it. The next slide, as uh, we'll just show real quick, it's, it's uh, uh, Jamie did this for me, but I understand it. Um, but it's, it's the different wi uh, widths of sidewalks, and we have all kinds of different widths downtown. Um, uh, and, and we have the, I would talk briefly about the existing trees on the next slide. These trees uh, to the east on the going up toward the top of State Street going east. Uh, they're, they're big, they're healthy, or as healthy as they can be. And the ones down, the uh, honey locust trees down uh, on Broadway uh, on the north uh, at the bottom there. Those are good healthy trees. We have a lot of help that, 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 that we can get on this entire project. Um, uh, Eric Mukey, who is the Western Urban Forestry with the North Carolina uh, Division of Forests, uh, is a urban forester that's hired by the state to help out cities and towns. One of the towns he helped out just recently was our uh, was the town of Hendersonville, and for example, they put together all these uh, uh, landscape species, uh, urban uh, development trees, comprehensive studies of different types of trees that will work really good. Uh, and uh, very detailed uh, kind of stuff, and I'm going to actually meet with him uh, anyway uh, at the end of the month. Uh, even on our, um, our um, what do you call it, commission, yeah. Uh, we, have, we, have a, we have Andy White. He's a registered consulting arborist and landscape designer with Land Arbor uh, Consulting. And we have Andrew Wagner, uh, he's a uh, ISA certified arborist with the Wagner Tree Service. So we've got some, we've got some, we've got a lot of uh, people that know uh, what's going on about these things. Uh, we're looking at a cost here, now briefly, um, I'll, I'll throw this at you, the planners, uh, uh, I think we can, we may be able to shoot for about $1,300 when the total price it includes the trees, the soil, the mulch, drainage rocks, the liners, and the shipping uh, to be just under $2,000. Um, uh, the, the types of trees that we'd be using, we'd be looking at a, uh, on an agenda, of, and that which is included in this, of about $120. Um, these trees uh, may not, uh, planters aren't the most, the, and I got to say, they're not the most ideal place, but in our environment down there, 
I would suggest that the next thing we could do is tear up the uh, all the sidewalks and rip up the infrastructure underneath and bring in some good soil and block off two or three parking spaces per per side of the road uh, and dedicate to just for the trees. Or we could go with the planters. Uh, that's up to y'all. Uh, uh, and and there are other things we can do as well too with the existing trees in the ground. We can we can we can do a better job of putting drainage in and around these trees to protect them. And the maintenance of this is going to be an ongoing thing. We're talking about, uh, there's, they, they got to be watered. Uh, we, we're restricted. We're not getting, you know, it wouldn't have been a problem this summer. Uh, we, we, it would have been a nightmare more than likely, uh, like it was everywhere else. But, but they're going to have to be watered. They're going to have to be pruned. They're going to have to be mulched. And annual plantings could be done in them with the beautification. Uh, anybody in here with beautification? Uh, but uh, there, there are other ways that we, uh, these things can be uh, used, and as well, like I said, there are uh, can be uh, relocated if have to be. And if the trees get in trouble and they die, or they get sickly, we can pull them out. We can plant them somewhere else, give them a more healthy location, and just put another tree in. Any questions? This two thousand dollar cost that you just uh, quoted is that per per planter per and tree and uh, all the, everything else that, that would have to go for the uh, upkeep of the tree. This is soil. The, the <laughs> what's, your, what's your estimate on the total number of planters that we're looking at? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, we're looking right now about uh, we'd like to do we we could go up to six per street. In other words, six on Broadway, six on Cherry Street, six on State Street, and three down at the town uh, park. Now, I know that John Duet was talking about they really wanted some kind of barrier situation right there between State Street and where that starts. And this is a what a, that slide that came up. I didn't see it come up. My uh, PowerPointing is not that good, is it? Um, that's a that's that's an asphalt. That's another better way to protect trees with that kind of grading system over it so you don't have a whole lot of uh, things. Now, I mean, granted, you're going to have a lot of Coca-Colas and, and, uh, and trash and, and cigarette butts in these things, but, uh, you know, that that's, could be part of the maintenance as well, taking care of that. Cokes, I, I don't think they're going to kill the tree. Van, this being in the historical district, any ideas for us, maybe some type of grants or anything? that could be used for that? Um, I don't know yet. I don't know. I, I maybe didn't even uh, look into that. I was, it took me a long time uh, to do what I did right here because I'm a pretty hard right-handed person. Uh, my wife's about ready to kill me because I'm, I'm so right-handed I can't even pull my wallet out with my left hand. And, and, uh, She's really tired of that excuse, uh, but uh, if she's looking, uh, but uh, yeah, I've, it's been a kind of a slow process, but all, all that can be looked into for sure. I, I don't know. Anybody else got any more questions? All right, as, you, as usual, thank you very much, Van. All right, all right, thank you all. Okay, next. We have the young ladies from the uh, Owen uh, FFA chapter reporting on some new barn plans. Um, their advisor is Ms. Fisher, and we have uh, Tipton, Ms. Tipton, if you'll raise your hand so the audience rec recognize you, and then Dora Harcharik, and then uh, Ms. Spillers. This summer we were blessed with the opportunity to be able to raise and train two sheep and one goat to show at various fairs here in Western North Carolina. I, sh I um, took care of the goat. We named him Boki and he placed very well in the fairs that we took him to. It was an amazing experience to get to be hands on with an animal and train them and go through the whole process of showing them. And I would love for more students at Owen to be able to have that opportunity too, especially for kids that want to go into vet science or poultry, or dairy judging. And for them to have that hands-on experience is something that they can use in their future. I um, took care of the bigger sheep. I named him Bobo. He was my baby. 
he trained very well, but he was also stubborn. But when you're in that arena, when you know you can make that sheep do what you want to, even if it doesn't want to, but you can still try to make it. It gives you a great feeling of responsibility, and taking care of it has given me a lot of responsibility. Because the only thing I've ever taken care of before was a dog. That was it. So this experience has boosted my self-esteem and has given me lots of responsibility. I had the opportunity to show the other lion this year. Um, we named him Edwin. Um, he placed very well in both of the fairs that we went to, taking third place at the Haywood County Fair. Um, it was a great learning experience. I'm very thankful for it. For the simple fact that, as Katie stated, it's a total new learning experience, as it was for all of us. Um, it's such a hands-on activity, and as being in one of Miss Fisher's animal science classes, just being able to take care of the animal and, you know, learn the anatomy and how the animal, you know, how the things that we do with the environment and how we help them, it affects their life. And um, just being able to, like, experience that hands-on and have that and take it into the classroom and being able to know what is actually going on and being able to see it, it's helped me so much. And it's just an amazing learning experience that I want a lot of students at Owen to have. But with our facilities right now, we don't have that, we don't have the area or the resources to do it right now. And that's something that I'm very passionate about as I want to go into the vet science area and be a vet and as we all are passionate about. And that's why we're here tonight. So, you know, as you can see, we have like our different things. You can see down there, um, Dory actually placed very well with our goat. Um, it was just, we went to the fair. It's a lot of fun um, just getting to show and everything. Um, we have different pictures here. Um, here's our barn plan that you can see. Um, we have actual copies of that. Um, yeah, they're being passed around. Um, and you can see here where we do different things at our school. But with all of this, and we have the resources and the, some of the labor with our ag mechanics classes to help with this you know, with this construction of the barn. But we don't have the funds. And we have a fundraiser. Um, we're actually selling t-shirts. And as you can see, Dory has them right here. And she can tell you more about that. So on the front it says, I believe in the future of agriculture. And then on the back it has the last paragraph of the FFA Creed. It says, I believe that American agriculture can and will hold true to the best traditions of our national life. And that I can hold, <laughs> what is else? <laughs> I, I did know it, but now I know. <laughs> and that I can exert an influence in my home and community that will stand solid for my part in that inspiring task. And these are $15 and $7 go straight to the barn fund. So if you want a new shirt, I'm going to have to face gotcha. <laughs> but um, as I said, it's just an amazing learning experience that we're trying to open up to other people at our school. We had the opportunity to do it, and we had the opportunity to grow as individuals and learn these different tasks and how amazing that was for us. And um, I'm sure that you all have questions for us, so I will actually turn it over to my advisor now, and we'll answer your questions to the best of our ability. Just real quick, um, the barn project is something that um, the Ag Department is trying to build to enhance our facilities. We've got um, myself and Mr. Paysauer, who's an excellent Ag teacher um, and my mentor teacher, um, and he has a greenhouse and his horticulture program is um, amazing. I mean, we win at contests all the time. We go to state all the time with his horticulture programs and me coming in as a new teacher, this is my third year at Owen High School, um, my background is animal science and that's kind of where we've, um, we've lacked a little bit. So that's basically why we want this barn project, um, why we'd like to get the facilities there so that we can enhance the learning that the students are getting in the classroom by getting the hands-on experience because there's really no better way to learn about the animals to understand the industry than to actually be out there doing it and this would give them the opportunity to do that. So. You have some questions? Anyone got any questions? What year are you ladies in school right now? We're all junior. We're all junior. Good, so you'll be there a little bit longer. Great. Well, did I miss it? How much are you trying to raise? 
We are trying to raise um, a total of twenty thousand dollars. We are um, almost halfway. We've had some very generous donations, um, and we are still working. I'm working on um, some grants with the lady at the county office, and there's some grants that are coming through that I have to apply for um, as far as the state FFA. Um, but we're still we're still a long way from our goal, but we are getting there. The T-shirts have helped a lot, and um, we got a couple other things in the works, and we'll see how those go. So, where would one get those t uh, if they wanted to buy a T-shirt? Where do they go to get it? Um, we have I have two with me today, which I don't know that are the biggest. Um, I don't have a. I think they're both smalls. They were just the first ones on the top, but we can definitely. Anytime, stop by the school, grab one, pick one up. Yes, sir. Um, we'll be happy to get you one. Otherwise, any of the events that we've done, we've done a couple um, bake sales, a couple. Um, Rockmont's been very helpful in letting us come out there on when they have activities at their, at their barn, and we sold food up there, and the T-shirts come with us there and that kind of stuff. So just about anything that we do, the T-shirts are there right now. <laughs> Alderman Stone wanted to know what's the biggest size you carry. He's about a, <laughs> he's about a five extra That's tall. That's true. <laughs> we have all sizes, no worries. Okay. Got that? Well, excellent. Appreciate you coming in. Especially the biggest thing is to be able to tell the community what you're doing. That's good. Keep us informed about how it, how it goes. And will this be like an Amish barn raising? Will it just be a big event one day to where hopefully over a weekend we it can are, be built? We're hoping for a lot of community involvement, so right. I think I think that would be good. And and if and if in fact that's the way that you're going to approach it, I mean I know you gotta get your foundation in and get all that, but then when the structure actually goes up, it'd be good for you to be able to come back and announce on the T V here that this is going to be and then invite the community to come out. Definitely. Very good. Thanks for coming, girls. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Social Justice Building um, by Philip Bassesi. Hello, neighbors. I'm Phil Bassesi, a professional engineer practicing in the fields of energy, environment, economics, and social justice are my tools of the trade. I couldn't be a good engineer without applying social justice to my projects or to my personal life. So my premise today is that to sustain communities, we must apply social justice. We must make good decisions from a viewpoint of social justice. If we make decisions just on who has the money and can we get a grant and can we use somebody else's money to do a project, instead of fleshing out the project first from a standpoint, what is the common good, we, we, we aren't going to maximize our potential as a community. I'm going to go through these Venn diagrams. I'd like you to look at them. I'm not going to announce everything. The next page, social justice. What is it? Well, to have social justice, we have to have communication. We have to do things that are useful to society. They have to serve the common good. What do you know? That's the golden rule, huh? Does anybody have any other good definitions for social justice? Oh, come on now. Let's say social justice is a viewpoint. It's something we have to filter our thinking through. Is it good for everybody? Or is it good for the least of us? Because as Bill Gates said, man will be measured on what he does for those who he has nothing in common with except their humanity. Next 
Thank you. Uh, every project we do has to be useful to society, not just serving as to feed some somebody's edif edifice complex, they call it. Somebody has to build something as a monument to themselves rather than as a something for the community. And a good example, Town Square is a great community building project. It just spells, it, you know, it just spells community everywhere rather than a public works project. And I have to commend John DeWitt for that. Oh. The common good. What goes into building the common good? Well, someone has to have an idea, an opinion, and they have to take action. But the big tool to getting to the common good is social justice. Now, hopefully somebody knows of some other topics that need to be put into this Venn diagram. Now, maybe we should have a homework assignment to use it, you that have this to come back with scribbling all over it next time. <laughs> but seriously, I want to use these diagrams as a way of thinking. I don't have paragraphs. I don't have a prepared speech. So I'm just going to keep marching ahead. And if anybody has any idea at any time, bring it up. What builds a community? People, the infrastructure, a sense of neighborliness, then economics. There's a lot more of the topics that build community. Come on, I want to see a hand. Come on, Pablo. Well, I might suggest it's maybe right down there in the bottom, neighborliness, maybe that says it all. And maybe, like when I was looking for a definition of social justice, maybe, maybe the golden rule says, says it all, and it's a nice, simple way to understand it, and we probably shouldn't get complicated with definitions. Maybe community, maybe neighborliness is the attitude that pulls everything else together and builds community. Now we have a balancing act. Community is at the fulcrum. Now we can pull this up with people, with their savings, with assets, with infrastructure, or we can drive it down with economics, with expenses, with applying a criminal justice type of thinking rather than a social justice type of thinking. As to attitudes that, that help to balance the sense of community. We have social justice and we have well-being and we have happiness and safety. Then sadness, poor health, hunger, poverty, poor in spirit. So there's the balance that we're doing when we try to build community. And I'd like somebody to suggest anything else that might tip it. Any other items that should be in this diagram. How about uh, good access to transportation, good access to, to uh, medical care, good access to an infrastructure that uh, really serves the people? But 
if people are poor in spirit because they just feel marginalized, we really have a bad situation. The next diagram, I don't want to dwell on this because it's a very sore subject. But there's been a lot written lately about inequality. Uh, our president has been talking about inequality. Um, I think the sense of equality has to come in the hearts and souls of each and, one, each and every one of us. We have to see each individual, no matter what their status in life, as being a dignified person. That will help to avoid the inequality. In other words, it shouldn't matter. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Somebody shouldn't judge me because I drive a Mercedes. It happens to be the oldest car in the parking lot and costs the least. But, uh, uh, some people want to put me in the rich class. Well, believe me, I'm in poverty, and I still have my dignity and my status and my old Italian jackets and so on. So you can't judge a book by the cover, and you shouldn't judge people by how they appear to you as first judgment. You should just figure they're equal to you in every way and treat them accordingly. That's a good definition of social justice that has to guide us. Are our decisions going to serve our needs? The fulcrum is a common good. The way to make decisions is dialogue, not monologue, me getting up here telling you what I'd like to see and how, what direction I'd like you to go in. But true dialogue, that people talk one to another back and forth, and things get discussed. I have another diagram which isn't in here on, on dynamic governance, and how you should have intelligent discussions and try to reach consensus rather than majority rule. That's a topic for another day, perhaps, but it gets right into the heart of social justice. What could we add to this diagram? We have a hierarchy on the left, we have people on the right. Should the people be making the decision to suit the needs, or should the hierarchy be making the decisions? That's a social justice question that we need to address. Anybody else have anything else they want to put on this balance scale? Homework for next time. Okay. Let's look at some examples of where we can apply social justice to try to build a framework. Here's an example. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have people going down Montreat Road, for instance, on a shuttle bus, bicycles, wheelchairs, every mode of transportation. We'd have a better community if people could just come down Montreat Road and get to, get to town safely. As it is, you can't run a a wheelchair because there's telephone poles in the middle of the sidewalks. So, there's a lot of corrections we have to do to our sidewalks in this town. Uh, if, we're, if we're going to have equality for people, those in wheelchairs who are equal to those who can run. Now we have some other things. 
the sidewalks make a town, and I want to make a suggestion of a number one low-cost immediate action activity, crosswalks and yield signs all over. Up here on the corner of 2nd Street, I believe it is, we have crumbling sidewalks and curbs that you can get a wheelchair off of, cross the road, and across onto the other sidewalk. That, that particular crosswalk needs improvement. Uh, on and on and on. I looked at crosswalks in this town, State Street going west. There's no yield sign going west. So uh, somebody did get run over in that crosswalk once. I'm advocating as a number one action to, to uh, get this social justice initiative off the ground that we take a careful look at all of our crosswalks and make them safe and sound. And that we do that immediately. It's a low cost thing. For the price of a planter, we can probably do, do 20 crosswalks right. So uh, uh, nobody can say we don't have money to, money to do the crosswalks right. I advocate that we do it right away. After that, we need a sidewalk from the Carver Center down to the parks, all the way past the Blue Ridge apartments. And um, I've talked to Tracy about that, and, or Casey rather, excuse me. And um, it really would help that part of town tremendously. But after we get a crosswalk, for instance, from the subdivision that Mountain Housing did that has a sidewalk in it, over to the other side of Cragmont, so people can, people can safely get from one sidewalk to another, then we'll have, then, then it's time to look at expanding the sidewalk system. There's some idea of where I think priority might be. Looking at an, any other ideas that people have for community-wide things that uh, are cheaper done, or not cheaper, are better done by doing them as a community instead of each individual trying to take care of himself. Well, Phil, one of the things we're going to be talking about later on <coughs> is exactly what you're speaking about here, sidewalks that will come up in the concrete the plan. Good. So Good. I think that, uh, Good. that uh, you can okay. link well, the presentation here. Yeah. Um, so we yeah. appreciate Good. it. Good. Well, I have one more, one more thing to mention, and that is natural gas pipelines. If we had a natural gas pipeline network around this town, we could save $1,000 a year for everybody who tied into it as compared to using fuel oil or propane. If we did it as a town endeavor, instead of making each and every individual petition the gas company to get, a, to get, to get natural gas, we could succeed in making this town more energy efficient and lifting everybody. Those people who'd have $1,000 more to buy food or whatever instead of spending it for propane. It's a good thing for us to put into our, into our future ideas that we talk about on comprehensive plans. So. Thank you. Very Thank you very much. All right, uh, next here, uh, John DeWitt, Recreation Commission Annual Report. Thank you all for allowing us to do the presentation. I'll be real short because we update you monthly on our activities, so this kind of highlights. First of all, I'd like to recognize our committee, uh, our commission members uh, do an outstanding job. We meet once a month. Next slide. 
uh, in terms of some of the accomplishments in the community, uh, naming the Flat Creek Greenway for Emily Russell. We've received almost $20,000 in grants this year, plus the 10,000 one that uh, is under your consent agenda. We've completed the safe routes to school sidewalk and we approved the whole sponsorship program for our disc golf, which has been very, become very popular. In terms of activities, we have uh, the formation of the Black Mountain Swim League. We've had a total of over 93,000 public interactions through the Recreation Department, through the parks, through uh, concerts, the swimming pool. We've had a very successful season at the swimming pool in spite of the bad weather. And I think all of you are well up to date on the great work Deanne is doing at the Senior Center. You got, should have had a brochure in your newspaper last week. It's just unbelievable all the things that she's been able to accomplish there. And the Recreation Commission right now is working on sort of a recommendation to you all on a sign policy so we have consistency in our parks on signs. In terms of the parks itself, we've had input into the town-wide comprehensive plan that you're going to discuss. We've had resolution of naming the Clevenger area Black Mountain Recreation Park that you all so generously approved last month. And we continue to reduce the non-migrating birds at Lake Tomahawk. Continue. I should add strongly. Just briefly because the town square is partly already under uh, the uh, Parks and Rec Department. Uh, the uh, Parks and Rec Commission has supported the town and deals with issues at its meetings, uh, has been involved in the planning of the town square, has had a lot of public support for that, and is coordinating closely with Casey and staff uh, as to uh, how it best would work when the whole park in May is turned over to the Parks and Rec Department. Especially, one especially thank uh, all of you for attending the dedication ceremony and the Christmas tree lighting ceremony and uh, the bathrooms. Uh, it was uh, turned out to be a very successful event. Uh, just to update, uh, the bricks have all been printed. Uh, we're getting ready to, uh, as soon as the weather clears up a little bit more, we'll start laying all the bricks out front. Um, the Rotary Fountain is under contract to design it, uh, so we're, uh, we'll be heading that up. Headley Garden, we will have that wrought iron fence in as soon as the weather gets a little better, hopefully next week. Uh, Ironworks has built a beautiful wrought iron fence that will go the full length of the Headley Garden along there to avoid people from walking across the garden and taking their dogs across the garden. So it's a beautiful uh, design. You'll, you'll love it. It's a beautiful fence that we've designed there. And uh, uh, Benicito's Fountain, as you've all seen, uh, works uh, unless someone unplugs it and then it freezes, but other than that. And also the uh, trees. Uh, we have uh, opportunity for people to have a tree with a plaque on it. It's on our website. If you want to buy a plaque instead of a bench or a table, you can buy uh, your name, dedication, memorial, ashes, I don't care. If you can put anything on there, we'll put a plaque on it. Uh, it's $2,500 to get a tree plaque planter named after you. So we'll hopefully we'll defray all the costs on that. Uh, next slide. Oh, the foundation, briefly, because that comes under Parks and Greenway sort of indirectly. Uh, we continue to provide uh, a foundation for fundraising activities for all these organizations right now. Uh, and it's been very successful. As you know, the Town Square uh, fundraising is under the foundation. But we also do the Tennis, the Beautification Committee, the Greenways Commission, the Friends of Lake Tomahawk, the Health Initiative, the Town Square Committee, and the Playground Committee all have funds that are designated in that and we have well over $300,000 uh, in that account, which supports the town's activities. Last, none of this could be possible without the great, great staff. I just cannot say the best about Casey and his staff, Jamie and his staff, and the park staff. Uh, they are fantastic. You, you are so lucky to have absolutely the top staff, I think, anywhere in the state of North Carolina that work here in the town of Black Mountain. So thank you all for your support. Thank you for what you've done. I agree wholeheartedly. We are very lucky to have a good staff. The company is no better than the people we got working for you. we got some good folks. Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer will give us a report now on the building and planning zoning.
Okay, um, so this will be our semi-annual report. Um, all numbers will be as of December 31st of 2013. Um, so starting with our permits, um, we are definitely up in the number of permits that we issued um, all the way back from 2008, which as you know, um, around November 2008 is when the housing bubble burst. Um, so that, that number is picking up quite steadily, um, and we were actually busier through our holiday season than we anticipated as well. Um, we're still kind of in line with our single family permits. Um, those are picking up though. We had an eight unit subdivision come in in December um, and we do have some pending permits for the settings. Um, so those are picking up. However, commercial we still are at this point doing nothing on. Um, both uh, building inspections, um, that definitely picked up this past six months. Um, and some of the zoning inspections picked up a little bit. Um, not as much as in the previous years, um, but definitely up from 2012. Um, for our um, fees, we were able to collect $162,653.78 total. That's all fees, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, construction. Um, just for the single family permits, um, we collected $53,155.98. Um, again, nothing for commercial. Um, if you go down to the valuations, as you can see, residential valuations are up tremendously from even 2009. Um, we are seeing building materials go up um, as well as, you know, construction coming back. So the, the building materials, will, I think, continue to, to uptick a little bit. Um, big slide. <laughs> uh, going to, um, this would be zoning complaints and violations. Um, we're about on track for both, um, well, for complaints. Um, violations, we did, did issue a little bit more than last <laughs> year, um, mainly due to the bears and trash. Um, during the summer. That, that was the majority of both complaints and violations um, for the past six months. Um, we issued 151 new business licenses, um, so that is up. Um, however, fees were slightly down for that. Um, most of those were going to be your contractors, um, and, and those don't bring in a whole lot of fees. Um, but we did get 32 new businesses just in the last six months. And for our staff happenings, um, we have completed our CLG report for our historic district. Um, that is an annual report that has to be done. Um, Dan Cordell attended a stormwater conference. Uh, myself, Mr. Cordell, Matt Settlemeyer, Ron Sneed, and several of our planning board and zoning board members attended a planning law update conference in Montreat um, that was given by Dave Owens of the School of Government. Um, I completed my ICS 300 course. Um, and myself, Dan Cordell, and Stacy Freddy all completed our hazard communication course as required by OSHA. Are there any questions? Um, just a couple of comments there. That sounded very encouraging when you were speaking about the complaints and the violations mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the fees. I assume that the bears were the primary complaint driven. They were. Yes, uh, they were. But were they fined? <laughs> they weren't, you know, and, and I made I made several jokes about it throughout the summer. I was going to find the bears and, you know, give them a talking to, but uh, yeah, that was the majority of the complaint. They were they were definitely worse this year than any year I've seen. So we're going to be needing to look at Don knows more about it now, but <clears throat> about the state wildlife has gone ahead and put in some some recommendations to change some of the uh, uh, ordinances and laws mm -hmm. about about bears. So, but if that doesn't help our situation, we're going to have to move to doing something. Right. I mean, you know, just the idea of having cute bears run around is just is just not not going to get it. And, you know, this board needs to sit down and talk about with you and with Dan and and with wildlife about what we can do because I'm afraid that it's just. I mean, the situation is getting mm -hmm. is just getting worse. Also, too, I wanted just to make sure for the public 
who've got seven million dollars in new construction, what that means to our budget is roughly in the neighborhood of about thirty thousand dollars. That'd be about right, wouldn't it, Dean? Something somewhere in that in that in that range is is that so that you know even though that sounds like a lot of money, the seven million dollars when you look at our budget. You know, and you figured the tax revenue that we're going to get on that, it's only the neighborhood to say about 30000 so uh, better than nothing. Right. But, you know, but it's, but that's just, that's just, when it comes to budget time, it's definitely something that we've got to keep in mind that, you know, that's not enough to really counter inflation. Right. As it moves forward, so. Very good. Anybody else got anything you want to say? Good job. Thank you. Okay, um, on the consent agenda, Matt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You've got uh, the adoption of minutes from your um, agenda workshop on December the 5th and your regular session on December the 9th. You have a budget amendment um, for an insurance settlement for a damaged radio in the amount of $560. You've got a budget amendment that uh, um, increases an expense account for contract services and reduces uh, uh, the account for salaries by $17,000, we've used some uh, temporary labor instead of hiring um, full-time people, and that's the, that's the adjustment that we've made there. Um, you've got an appointment of Freddie Robinson to serve as the Board of Aldermen's appointment until January 2016 for the uh, Black Mountain Firemen's Local Relief Fund. And finally, on the consent agenda, you have um, a recommendation to name a new playground at the Carver Community Center in honor of Lib Harper. This, is, this comes about... Uh, um, we, we applied for a grant from a company called, or a grant called Kaboom that, that uh, funds playground equipment. We received that grant in the amount of $15,000. There's some additional fundraising that uh, will occur privately. When that is done, then, uh, then the playground will be installed there. And this is the first step of that is to, to um, and the Recreation Commission um, uh, 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 supported this, this idea to, to name this the Lib Harper, um, to, 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 to honor Lib Harper with this playground equipment, it w of course would not be installed until all the money was does, was raised and the difference is, is raised on a, on, a, on a private level. But, um, but, but we do have the grant amount in $15,000. And so this would start that off. When, that's, when that is installed then in, in the future, we will of course have a ceremony and a dedication for, uh, for that piece of equipment. Thank you, Matt. Uh, do I hear a, a motion to approve the consent agenda? Absolutely. Any discussion? I have one correction on the minutes, uh, December 9th, and, uh, under citizen comments for Elaine. Uh, she stated Mr. Showers has served on the board longer than any other currently serving alderman with the exception of Mayor-elect Bartlett. That should be Mayor-elect Sobel, I believe. Okay. We'll, we'll make that change. Okay. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Okay, passes unanimous. We're now at citizen comment before new business. If anybody wishes to speak, they can come up to the mic and speak for three minutes. Okay, seeing no one. Uh, new business. We have to fill the vacancy that has been uh, because of Larry Harris resigning from the uh, ABC board. We have received two applications um, on this. And um, one from Rick Harwood and one from Leslie Carrera. Um, I think probably the best way to go about this, unless anyone objects, is just simply just to do it in the order in which they were time, time-wise. Rick mm -hmm. went ahead and applied first, even though Leslie got her her um, application in by the four o'clock deadline. Yes, sir. We'll go ahead and, and if that's all right with y'all, uh, I'll put the, the name, if someone wants to nominate, well, the name of Rick Hardwood is on the floor then. So then whoever wants to vote for favor, you can vote in favor, and then if we don't get a majority, then we will go to Leslie. But if we get a majority for Rick, then Leslie will not be uh, considered. So. Rick Hardwood's name is on the floor, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
So it's a unanimous 5-0 vote. In addition, Mr. Mayor, now, um, and we put this all as one item, but you, but you you would then need to appoint a chair since you filled the vacancies for the position to appoint a chair of the three sitting members. I'll need to get a nomination from the board as to uh, as to the chair. Mayor. If I could, I'd like to nominate Bill Christie as chair. Okay. Second that. Um, any other nominations? <coughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Bill Christie, we the chair. Then. Thank you for mentioning that, Matt. I overlooked that. Uh, any unfinished business? Yes, sir. All right. We'll now move on to the public hearings. So to hear a motion to, uh, well, this is a public hearing on text amendments for zoning and use for breweries, distilleries, and wineries is recommended by the planning board. Uh, hear a motion by Ms. Carlo Showers. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. So it's, 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 it's now open and we're going to have a report. Well, I'm, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind having Brian Taylor just from the planning department, he, he made the, wrote the text amendments and, uh, and and walked us through the process of the planning board just to give you a brief overview of what the of what of what you're discussing tonight. Good evening. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown here. Does everyone have this table? Okay. Uh, the purpose of this zoning amendment for breweries, distilleries, wineries, and cideries was to create more space in uh, Black Mountain for these emerging craft industries and uh, support the town's goals of creating local businesses and supporting their growth. Uh, we did that uh, with a few amendments here, and the first one I'm going to mention, uh, if you would just look on the left-hand side of the definitions. We created uh, new definitions for distilleries, wineries, and cideries. These were previously not included uh, in the land use code. We also created definitions for micro versions of these establishments. And we also edited the definition for brewery and tried to make everything a little bit more um, simple and easy to understand. And then uh, in terms of changes in actual zoning for breweries, distilleries, uh, wineries, and cideries, uh, they're permitted uses in the industrial districts and they're uh, proposed as conditional uses in the commercial districts, uh, highway business and central business district. And for the uh, microbreweries, distilleries, wineries, and cideries, um, those are proposed here as uh, permitted by right in the industrial and commercial districts. I don't think I mentioned there that the, uh, breweries, distilleries, wineries, and cideries, not the micro versions, are permitted by right in the industrial districts just as the breweries are now. Uh, another um, change here that the planning board wanted to do was uh, for all of the uh, uses here in the office institutional zone uh, to be allowed as conditional uses. That includes these uh, micro establishments as well as brew pubs and bars, uh, which you see here a change from permitted by right to conditional. Uh, and there was one small change here. Uh, since the planning board met in October, the maximum annual reduction was set uh, in common units and at a common threshold of 100,000 gallons. And that's relatively low. Um, there's a lot of precedent for breweries uh, in terms of the production limit to distinguish between a micro and a regular, but not so much for distilleries and cideries. But uh, 100,000 gallons is kind of low. It's uh, equivalent to 3,175 barrels, and a microbrewery, the cutoff can be anywhere between 5,000 and 15,000 barrels based on other zoning codes that were reviewed to um, develop this text amendment. amendment. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm sure <laughs> it's not, it doesn't all sink in at once. Any questions on the board? Well, I have a couple, Brian, since you're up there. Um, and mine, first of all, thank you to you and the planning board and Jennifer for taking the time to come up with these definitions. I think it's important to add these since this is such a growing industry in our area. Um, I'm certainly glad that it's going to be addressed in our land use code. 
and in our comprehensive plan as well. Um, I just had a question as to uh, the categories and the, the districts where you have it permitted by right, and in particular the office institutional, where you've got the restaurant, uh, brew pub and tavern, and bar as conditional uses, and then also in the highway business eight, where we've got the distillery and brewery as conditional, and the winery as conditional. And I was wondering what was the, the thought process behind making those conditional uses instead of just permitted by right? Uh, well, if you're talking about the, the larger facilities, right. uh, well, we wanted those to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Because mm -hmm. um, really the big thing you might be worried about here is truck traffic. Yeah. And um, 100,000 gallons per year is pretty low. I don't think you need to worry about that. But it could be that someone wants to open up a facility with uh, 30,000 barrels annual production. And based on where that is in some of these districts, um, it might put extra stress on roads uh, and create disturbances for nearby neighborhoods. So for these larger types of facilities, uh, they, may, they may be appropriate, but we wanted to judge them on a case-by-case -case basis. What is capacity of uh, Pisgah? What are they? I wasn't able to find uh, Pisgahs, but I did, I did look at some other ones. Um, Highland Brewing was... Uh, I think they were planned for 30,000 uh, barrels annually, and they're, I believe, the largest in the region, yeah. I, although not anymore. So Sierra Nevada, 800,000 eventually. New Belgium, uh, 500,000 barrels, and that's a lot, that's a lot of gallons. Uh, so 100,000 gallons is only a little over 3,000 barrels. But I think Pisgah is probably going to be underneath Highland, so I'm, I'm guessing they're under 30,000 barrels annually. May I ask if you have uh, proposed any, and the conditional uses, have you prescribed any conditions to be met for these conditional uses specifically? None specifically. All right, unless there's no more questions then. Thank you, Brian. Um, need to get a motion to close the public hearing. Is, is there anything that we need to be thinking about there, Mr. Attorney? Every time we have a conditional use, I'm reminded when Al Wagner was on your uh, Board of Adjustment, which here's conditional use permits, applications. He said, don't give me conditional use unless you tell me what the conditions are. Uh, and you've got the general conditions for conditional use, but your planner was referring to uh, possible, you know, stress on highway systems, road systems, uh, overloaded traffic, and that just brought to mind, are there any specific conditions that you want to place on that these conditional uses have to meet in addition to the general conditional use? Permit requirements. I just want to know if planners were recommending you. All right. Um, when you get a motion then to close the public hearing. I so move. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, now we need to get a motion to adopt the proposed text amendments as presented. So moved. Okay. Motion by Larry. Any comments? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. It passes. It's a question now. I don't know if it pertains to this or not, but the um, spirits that are produced at these places, is it, are they taxed in Black Mountain? They'll, they'll, of course, any of this will be regulated from, from at the state level from ABC, so they would, all those would be regulated in that regard, and then they would, there would be, um, through that process, there would be uh, some benefit, benefit to us, but I think only from the, only from the retail sale side of it not from the distribution side of it but it'll be it would be clearly regulated at the state level all right the next public hearing is for the rezoning of a portion of old lakey gap road as recommended by the planning board um, we'll open it up and then i'll ask jennifer to come up and make the presentation um, so we need to get a motion opening a hearing for rezoning a portion of old lakey gap road i'll make that motion okay all in favor Aye. Aye. opposed all right, Jennifer, can you please come up and lead us through this? Thank you. 
Um, so before you tonight is a proposal for rezoning a portion of, um, it's actually just one parcel of Old Lakey Gap. Um, and it doesn't have an address, so that, that makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, but in your map, you do have a kind of a small map, um, but it's a lot right behind the fitness center off of uh, Jane Jacobs Road. Um, so, again, Sykes Reagan is the one that is asking for this rezoning. Um, as you know, Mr. Reagan is the developer of the village of Cheshire. Um, he is proposing to rezone that. Um, it is currently rezoned as TR4, which is our town residential district, to the TND, which is the traditional neighborhood district that all of the village of Cheshire is zoned. Um, he is wanting this so that the property will be contiguous with that development. Um, I also put at your stations there a map of the 1998 master plan that was approved. Um, and down at the bottom in yellow is what he is specifically referring to. Um, and it's for single family residences. Um, just to let you know, um, also at your stations is the actual deed document. And there are some deed restrictions that were placed on the property from the Georgia Honeycutt Estate um, regarding any type of construction. Um, and those, let's see, um, construction shall be limited to a maximum height of 30 feet um, from the ground level elevation of the pavement. Um, no construction shall be closer than 40 feet from the margin of the pavement of Old Lakey Gap. No apartment shall be constructed and no more than 10 units per acre shall be constructed. Um, Mr. Reagan is aware of these restrictions um, and is, you know, will comply with those and these will also um, be double checked if he comes in for any building permits, when and if he comes in for any building permits. So before anything's ever constructed, um, we'll make sure all that's applied for. Um, all property owners within 200 feet did receive their notice um, we did have a couple of phone calls um, just regarding what use that property would, would become. Um, and I believe that's been about it. And I'm not sure if Jesse Gardner wants to add anything to this, um, but I know he's been working with Mr. Reagan as well. So, all right. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Jess Gardner with Civil Design Concepts. So we're... Um, essentially been the engineer of record for Sykes and Cheshire for several years. I, you know, uh, the master plan you have in front of you is done back in, uh, not, I think, 1998. And uh, we had uh, planned, or the land planner at that time had planned th this parcel, though Sykes didn't actually own it. Uh, and I think when uh, the town actually went through our rezone process five or six years ago that it didn't hit anybody's... Uh, Sykes didn't catch it, uh, but that when we went through the whole town's process, it probably should have just went, went ahead and got tossed into TND since we have an approved master plan for it. So we just thought we'd submit a rezone application and get it back into uh, uh, Sykes, uh, into the TND zoning district. Um, it, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be feel free to uh, answer them best I can right now. Jesse, this uh, talking about that the um, no no building is to be higher than thirty feet from the ground level of the is, is, of the pavement. Is that what I'm? I would. I'm hearing? I mean, I saw that in in the deed. I'd have to go find that actual recorded document that it references and make sure I read it. And I think that came. It was from the Honeycuts to the settings and then the settings passed it on on sites that makes it pretty low doesn't it uh it says 35 what 30, 30 feet. feet 30 feet from the ground level the road level the pavement. I mean, that's, that's three story home yeah but then again if you look at that land that land flows down towards the cheshire sure. and so that if you the closer you get to the fitness center uh, you could even get, you could probably pick up another 15, 20 feet yeah, I, I would, of a uh, height on that. Yeah, I, three stories doesn't scare me. I think he, we're sticking with probably some type of uh, uh, pocket development or uh, cottage development. 
as the ID in this area, so I don't see anything great being. I don't see that being an issue, though. I, I would have to see the. Well, but leave it in the most dense um, of and just looking at the at the master plan here. You know, uh, the most dense part of this particular development of the Cheshire, the one that's directly behind all the businesses, mm -hmm. is that more than ten units per acre? Because I would assume everything else would fall would not would not be that dense. You're, I'm just I'm just trying to get some ideas. Are you speaking of, of what's shown on this master plan for this specific parcel of this density? No, 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 no. I'm or, talking or about on the north side. Of on the town. north side. I'm yeah, just, so, north, that, so that people north. have an idea because they know what that is. Yeah, that's uh, some of the. It is pretty dense, but I think it's a right at about 10 units an acre is the most dense, and so yeah, I, I think we'll be okay. in scale with that for All sure. Right, that's fine. That's just, uh, just give the public something so yeah. they can uh, relate to. Um, any other questions? If not, I entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now to adopt, I need a motion to adopt the rezoning of a portion of Old Lakey Gap Road as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, it passes unanimous. All right. Does that include that barn that you have over there? Is that right? The side no, of that is. That does include that. Oh, no. So that's going to be history. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, now we got a public hearing for the town of Black Mountain Comprehensive Plan Updates as recommended by the Planning Board. Uh, do, I hear, do I have a motion so that we can open up the hearing? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Again, we'll have Brian to come forth to. Did that, I, well, he gave a presentation a couple of months ago. I'd be glad to have him come up and answer specific questions about it. I, um, I would point out that you had uh, requested at the agenda session um, a, a marked up version of the of of the plan that kind of shows what's new, what's existing, or, or what's a carryover from the from the existing comprehensive plan, and what what may be new. Brian has uh, has gotten that done, and, and that should be in at your seat. Um, but I'd be glad to have Brian come up and, and answer specific questions. I, I uh, if I recall from the um, presentation that we had done in the fall, one of the issues at that time, uh, at least from the public comments at that time. Uh, involve the minimum housing code. The section of the comprehensive plan that addresses that basically um, says that uh, the town of Black Mountain will uh, enhance and enforce their existing uh, minimum housing code. We have, uh, um, I know the Housing Commission has made a recommendation to the planning board that's been reviewed from uh, from the legal per side of that and, uh, and, and we feel like that, that language is in compliance. It's still coming through the process, of course, and ultimately any changes any changes that it, that would occur would have to come to the to the board of aldermen. I think that was the issue at that time, um, and I, so I do want to make sure that you you're aware that that is that is being addressed. But if there are specific questions about the plan, either I'll answer them or I'll have Brian come up and answer them. And if the, if the public, of course, has any comments. If y'all have any questions and anything, I'm, I'm, I, there's several in here that I have. I've gone through this book, and so I want to bring up several things. But if y'all have anything that you want to talk about, feel feel free to ask me first. And if I could just say one thing, because I know that, that uh, I'm not sure that, that Alderman Stone was here when it was done, and I know that Alderman Harris was not on the board at that, at that time. You know, the comprehensive plan is, is, is a broad um, policy document that, that we will then use um, to guide us as we, as we move forward when you make decisions for the upcoming budgets, um, exist uh, decisions about priorities for what you want to fund and what you want to uh, um, accomplish as a board. Um, you have a lot of leeway within the comprehensive plan for 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 you all to then to prioritize and to uh, attach the funding that would be required for some of the priorities. For example, you know we we've set aside money um, in capital reserve funds for greenways, for um, improvements to public buildings, to the uh, uh, improvements at Lake Tomahawk. Those sorts of things are also are, were high priorities in the comprehensive plan. You all have the, uh, the final say then, of course, in how that, is, how that is funded in the timeline 
that we move forward with those things on. So I, I do want to make it clear what the um, what the role of the comprehensive plan is um, as as we move forward. That it's a, that it's an umbrella of the vision that we have that you all have for the uh, um, for the future of Black Mountain, and then, and then obviously as we move forward, budgetary decisions, capital improvement decisions, those sorts of things are, are pieces that then make up this plan. Yeah, I was here the, uh, at the board meeting when Brian presented, when they spoke and presented the plan, and, and I reviewed it also. So. Yeah, one of the questions I had, Brian, um, was in dealing in the housing. Uh, yeah, if you could come up. And, uh, again, I realize that the planning board has gone has gone through this again. Just just to give a little background, this was done ten years ago. Will Kennedy was the one that uh, initiated this, and um, several uh, board members and citizens of the community got together and worked for over nine months to put this thing together. So, and it needs to be updated, and that's what Brian's Brian Brian's doing. Speaking of updating here, we've got goals in here, and they and they all sound good, especially about affordable housing. Except that I don't see anything in here that addresses the only real, what I feel is the only real affordable housing, and that's manufactured housing. Mm -hmm. Was that discussed? I see that it's not that it's not listed in here as as a goal, uh, as 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 how to treat it or how to encourage it. I think you. Uh need to include it but and it is something that's emphasized in some plans as part of their of their affordable housing strategy and uh it's nowhere in here in these action items but uh, i think it might be in the consortiums plan which is basically what guides many of these uh, municipalities is um the regional consortium uh, for housing uh, there are some strategies within there that are appropriate for municipalities and i believe there's one action item that says implement here it is h112 Implement selected actions recommended for jurisdictions in the Consolidated Strategic Housing and Community Development Plan. I believe there are uh, some proposed strategies in there uh, related to manufactured housing. Okay. Okay. Would you keep us updated on that? Or if you, as a matter of fact, if you would find what they, whenever they do pass theirs, if you'd make sure that we get a copy. Oh yes. Of that. Of that also. I think they have a meeting coming up. Uh, Stormwater. Uh, building out the stormwater. I mean, this is uh, uh, this is definitely something that we've got to to uh, work on here. And I, I know that you've got some action items here on it. Uh, have you got anything specific that you can update for the public? Uh, well, this uh, the stormwater. Uh, I'd like to distinguish. There were two highest uh, priority action items here. One was with the construction of. Um, uh, a new downtown stormwater system, which relates to the drainage of the stormwater, uh, which is in the utilities uh, section. And there was also one related to stormwater best management practices, which relates to water quality, making sure that the water that gets into the Swannanoa is not filled with pollutants. Uh, the Swannanoa is categorized as the impaired stream. So um, those were two new highest priority action items. A lot of the highest ones will continue, but those two, which you've mentioned, um, are some of the highest priority ones that weren't in the last plan. And as far as specifics, those would be in the stormwater um, master plan that McGill did in 2009. They have a proposed uh, system and they divided it in two into an east basin and a west basin. Right now, there's just one large stormwater system for downtown and it hits that large barrier where the train tracks are and about 90% of it goes into that engineer channel next to the railroad, which is in very poor condition. Um, based on the McGill report and also in a, in a sort of walking tour that we did with Bob, um, Bob Watts back in March or April. Uh, and they're proposing to divide that in half so you can keep the uh, pipes, keep the pipes from getting too large in size and just to divert more down, I believe it's Black Mountain Avenue and spit it out into the Swannanoa further west. And uh, these are old estimates, but the West Basin was $450,000, and the East Basin was more like $300,000. And those are just um, preliminary estimates in McGill's 2009 report. Just a second, then. And Matt, right now you're working on going ahead and making sure that all the stormwater has been TV'd. Yes, as a matter of fact, we should have a quote. We, MSD had offered. Um, 
to do some of that for us, they, they've just become busy doing that. And so uh, Jamie Matthews is getting together a quote to get that done at the end of this week. So to, to get the quote together by this week, of what, there's going to be some cost to us to do that, to, uh, to camera those lines and have, a, and have a comprehensive view of what of the, of the existing system that's in the ground now. And then what's kind of your game plan after that? Well, depending on, I, I frankly don't know yet what that, what that cost will be. So when that comes back, if it's something reasonable that we can work into this year's budget, then we will do that. If it's something a little more expensive, we'll have to work that through the budget process and do that then as we, as we move forward. So you think that that's when, we'll, when the rest of the board will be able to see what we need to do? And if you want to see what's in the ground, then um, I, think, I think you're looking at summertime before that, before that could happen. So we're going to have pictures. It, yeah, what they what they did with the with the with the section that we that we first did from uh, when they had the, the the sinkhole right there at um, number nine in Sutton, yeah. we came up there and they have a what you end up with is a DVD that you then watch and then you, we can put it on the screen and you can kind of see what uh, what kind of what the condition is under the ground. But I think, Mr. Mayor, some of that will depend on the uh, the cost as it comes back. If it's if it we may do some sections and go ahead and, and present that, or we may do something comprehensive. I don't know until I have a quote yet on what, uh, what, how we'll move forward with it. Okay. All right. Um, when we get over here, Brian, into the strategic, uh, the, like, the, like the town strategic energy plan, mm -hmm. um, is that anything that we've got a plan on yet as to how we're really going to address that to try to have some long range of the next five, six, ten? Not years? unless there's something specific that uh, that they've discussed. That's that's that is a priority that we've now added in. There's not a specific plan in place. That's something we we need to work towards. And I think uh, that's one of the things that I you. I think there is actually. Okay. Uh, the Waste Reduction go. Partners did a for that 2009 part. strategic energy plan. I don't know how many action items in there have been. Um, carried out since then. I believe that was adopted in 2009, but it was sort of seen as a way to update those things with an eye on energy and also on water conservation, which was very important to, um, I think, the board and citizens. Yeah. If, if you could get, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have that plan. If, if you could give me a copy of that I, through the I have map, a copy. And then that's that. something, too, we can bring to the board for budget right. as we begin just to, just to uh, talk about that. Uh, we've already talked about recycling and the fact that, that uh, hopefully we can go ahead and try to, if we end up we're fortunate enough to get that land down near the, uh, the uh, ballpark in the Black Mountain, you know, maybe, maybe do something on that. Uh, Phil says he did mention this thing about the sidewalks. I noticed that, uh, uh, that in the action items on the sidewalk network goals, uh, actions, uh, they address what Mr. Pesesi was talking about, the crosswalks, the intersections, and of course then does talk about trying to get some new, some new sidewalks going. Uh, so where are we just as an update on finishing the Montreat zone? Okay, we've finished the, the most, the, the phase, we just completed the phase that go, that uh, um, most recently to, to Cotton, and I believe we're doing, we're in the design phase for the next, um, the next step of that, which goes to East Avenue, is that correct, Jesse? I want to make sure I'm right. But the next phase goes to East Avenue, and we're in the design phase. And we're and once once we have a little bit, I think we've we've uh, narrowed down some design. Of course, we'll have to get some easements, and we'll start that process, and we'll budget that with our Powell Bill funds and move that forward too. Okay, because we've got because uh, again, if the board passes this comprehensive plan as amended uh, by the planning planning board, these things have these priorities on them, and, those, and that is the highest priority. And then another highest priority is to implement other priority sidewalks. And so that if you could present that to the board so that they, when they begin to budget in the spring. Right. I think, I'll be honest with you, uh, and, and we, will, we will be glad to present that. I think that most of your, um, most of your resources currently are going towards um, extending the sidewalk down Montreat Road. That, I think, was ranked as one of the higher priorities. And that's, and that's, where, the, that's where our resources so far have been budgeted. We obviously we had a, a safe route to school grant that uh, that completed some um, across the street from elementary school, but in terms of, of out of our PAL bill funds, the priority right now is Montreat Road, and we'll move that forward because those phases are just a little more a little more costly, and we'll move that forward as quickly as we can. Okay, 
Uh, moving forward, then we're talking about working with Greenways to you know finish the Riverwalk Phase Two Trail. And uh, just a quick update on where we are. Yeah, I was actually on my update, so we. Uh, you want to wait? No, I, I mean, I, no. Let's, let, I mean, it was just going to be okay. where I did the at the end. So, um, uh, Baker Engineering is doing our is doing a hydrology study. We've got the the parameters in place for that, and they'll be starting um, probably this week or next week, kind of depending well on the on the weather, with doing the hydrology study under 70 under the rail trestle and under Highway 9 of the. Of, what amounts to a, a, a study to, to make sure that our greenway doesn't impact um, the the river and those crossings there, and, and that way we can then go to DOT in Norfolk Southern and explain and, uh, and hopefully get a, a permit to, to do that. That is the the preferred route, I believe, that the the Greenway Commission has uh, um, advocated for is to go under those under those three. And so we're looking at some alternatives too, in case that is not feasible. But that but but we're starting that process now, and you're probably looking at 60 days to have that completed. Uh, even though it's listed here as a highest priority item, uh, we've got here work with DOT, NCDOT to explore strategies that address the traffic flow at the intersection of Montreat Road, State Street, and including the Montreat Road realignment, um, and alternatives such as signal timing. So I'm assuming then that this, I, that what this means then is not so much the realignment of the road as it is with the signal. That's right. Any any. Anything that we do that evo that involves um, the traffic issue at Montreat and State Road and, uh, and and State Street is going to involve coordination with DOT, obviously. And so, what the, I think the the goal of that is to take a look at signal timings and other um, other options that we may have there. There, you know, there's no there's no funding in place for the realignment and, and the, the the sidewalk is is built there. Um, but there are other other things that we could look at, and we would look at that in conjunction with DOT. Okay. And then Maggie, you'll keep us up to date then on what the other highest priority item is, which is work with French Broad and Metropo in the MPO on the exit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that is. Okay. Fine. When when if you're moving through the um, the uh, review of the comprehensive plan work, were, was were there any other Alternatives, alternatives considered other than the exchange of Blue Ridge Road? I think that was mentioned. I just referred to the document I found from 2000 where there was a study done by DOT. Right. DOT studied it before. Right. Um, I, there was another exit. Was it Lytle? Lytle. 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 But I, was, I couldn't find anything recent on right. the status of that. The DOT studied that at that time. DOT studied the, the Blue Ridge Road interchange with estimates in terms of cost and how many houses it would affect and things like that. Right. But also studied Lotto Cove at the same time as an alternative. I'm not. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah, I don't have to check that, that, but. It would be sort of interesting if you could check on that first, man. We'll check and go back and see what that, what some of the results of that initial study were. I mean, we're kind of in uh, um, the next, you know, that we're in the next phase of the, not, not a next phase of it, but in but a new phase right. regarding that interchange. So we'll go back and look at that old state, make sure we've got our got our information. I don't think that was purposely ignored as, as an option. No, no, I don't think it was. So that's something that could definitely be changed. Well, I mean, there's there's issues among those of us on the, on the board about that. I'm glad right. Larry, Larry brought it up. But that, you know, it, it could be that, you know, even though we're all in agreement with one thing, we need another exit. Right. That's not a, that's that that's not an issue. It's just decide where to put it, and of course, and that's 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 where the issue will come down. This was probably one of the it was the highest rate of hurry, but we also understood it was one that we've been contentious in the past. Yeah. All right. Also, then, in the under the utilities, it talks about the the you know the maintenance of the, of the Lake Tomahawk, and of course, we're going to be redoing the dam. Uh, well, redoing. The, we're going to do some. Uh, we're Doing some maintenance on the dam in terms of the trees, of, yes. removing the trees. Yes, that's right. It'll be the same dam, but the dam. and then the dredging. Yes. So what we've done, we we uh, you know in, in the budget for this this year, we set aside a hundred thousand um, dollars for the dredging. Our 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 quote had come in closer to the two hundred thousand dollar range. And so what we would anticipate then is setting aside more money in the upcoming budget so that we can do the dredging in next year's budget. And you anticipate that. During winter time, I think we do that during the during the winter time is the most is when you would uh, when you would do that. Now the tree now the tree work we're getting ready that's going to be done. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, 
um, Jamie Matthews and I met with the engineers on uh, on Friday, and they and they tagged the trees that uh, that the state's not going to allow to stay on the stay on the dam, and we'll and we'll walk through that process. That's going to be springtime when that's done. By the time that's done, though, so we'll do that. We'll budget some additional funds for the for the dredging and do that in the winter time when it when it will, hopefully we'll minimize some of that. Energy. This is obviously not in the plan. This is just something that I'd like to throw out. Uh, for, for y'all to consider, and that is if it does occur next winter, especially around Christmas time, that we take advantage of all the old Christmas trees that we've got and put them in the middle of the lake with them being tied down with center blocks and stuff to create a habitat for the for the brim and the, and the restocking that we will be doing. Uh, it'll certainly help the fish population in that, in that, in that way. Um, now under the Parks and Recreation, uh, the the Carver Center. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we've done a lot of talk about this, and I think everyone's in agreement that we've got to do work on that. Did they did the planning board get into any specifics or on a timetable on what to do about the Carver and in, in a way in which to, to attack that? No, I think they were just waiting for that to come out in, the, um, I guess, the Rec and Parks Master Plan, which I think they were going to start on this year. But... Uh, Real details in terms of the timeline were not discussed by the planning board. Because if you look at, I mean, to me, I think that's 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 one of the most important things that we could do, not only just for the renovation of the of the building, but the savings that we could achieve. Because we're spending what right around twenty 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 five thousand dollars heating that place for the for the utilities there. Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. But and, and you know we had anticipated um, a grant. Um, a CDBG, what they call a Catalyst One grant, but that was not funded by the state this year, so we, we were not able to uh, um, apply for a grant. And that would have been a that would have been a quality um, project under the guidelines of that grant. So this will come back up again in your budget process as we move forward. Carver will, will. parking on Cherry Street. Did that come up? Parking downtown in general came up uh, specifically on Cherry Street. Uh, I don't know if it was discussed in that detail, but um, most of it was discussed in regards to the MAB plan and the parking right around Town Square. Because if we're going to be looking at possibly having to imp implement some new stormwater pipes on Cherry Street, that may be a time to look at and to see if and by chance that could be a, a great way to add some parking by just making it a one-way street. Instead of having parallel park, I mean, uh, you know, we got to back in on parallel parking to have the straight in parking. Something, something to consider. Anyway, those are the questions I had. Just some comments to make about the plan. Uh, anybody else? Brian, yeah. thank. Oh, excuse me, Brian. Well, before I had any comments, we've got a lot of people here. I didn't know if uh, anyone in the public wanted to, to say anything before we continue discussion on it. I'm not seeing a whole lot. I'm gonna go ahead. My, Continue discussion on, on on the comprehensive plan. If you guys had anything that we haven't addressed, yeah, because it, because this is this, this is, is the is public document. hearing. I mean, this is time to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I do have one yeah. question. Please come right up. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. I think we're done. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to raise this question, but not knowing any better, I'll do it. Uh, talking about the breweries uh, and uh, conditional zoning for the breweries. Uh, in many years past, I have visited large breweries that have a tasting room where they give away their product, and basically what it is is a bar. And uh, I wonder if any consideration has been given to that possibility in breweries or microbreweries that may be located uh, in Black Mountain. Uh, my personal opinion is I would, I'm happy to see new industry, new jobs come in, but I am not happy to see a proliferation of bars. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they would like to address about the comp comprehensive plan? <coughs> Phil, if you want to come up to the mic, please.
Phil Bassassi, 15 Highview Drive. I think we need to do some prioritizing. Uh, <clears throat> two things definitely. Carver Center is one of our greatest assets. It's been neglected for way too long. It needs to be upgraded, period, and put to its best use, not just not just let to wander. It's our asset, our town. We can't ask the federal government to give us money to do something about it. We have to pull it up by our own bootstraps. Another priority is crosswalks. Very low cost, maybe $20,000 for the whole town to make every crosswalk safe. I think that should be approved within a month. Let's look at everything else in the master plan from a standpoint of how useful is, how useful is it and how can we prioritize it. Because the master plan is very general and those generalities can end up with nothing getting done. If we can come up with some simple things that cost in the tens of thousands of dollars it could be done quickly. We'll make some progress. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before we close the public hearing? All right. The mayor. Yeah. Um, if citizens are finished, no more citizens. Well, we can close the public hearing then, and then, and then we can All talk. Right. So, uh, I have. I have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. On favor? Aye. Uh, okay, now for uh, board comments, Carlos. Okay. Whenever I see the word safe or safety, that just sends up a red flag to me, and as it is, you know, the color associated with transportation is red. Uh, if you look at T6.1.1, provide roadways that are safe for drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders of all ages. And that has a medium priority rating. I think that should be high. Um, and one of the areas that I think in particular, when we start talking about Phil and his presentation, I think that's very important, the sidewalks mm -hmm. and crosswalks and what have you. But I also think about Cragmont Road in that corridor through town. It is much traveled. Um, it has a posted speed limit, but that speed limit's not always followed. And I think very recently, there was a pretty serious accident uh, on that road. Um, I don't know how we, the town in conjunction with the state, if that is a state thoroughfare or not, how we go about maybe implementing some type of um, speed bumps or breakers or whatever to slow vehicles down on that road. I think it might be a good investment as far as, you know, we have a lot of vehicular traffic, we have a lot of pedestrian traffic, people riding bicycles, you know, whatever. And I know it's a, it's a big stretch to ask our law enforcement to be out there and, you know, try to patrol it every day or set up dummy cars or whatever. So if we could maybe look at it from the perspective of putting in some kind of speed bumps or breakers at certain points of it, I think that should be a priority. Uh, uh, let me just... I Cragmont Road, you know, is split between uh, um, being DOT responsibility and, and town responsibility. It, it, uh, it's, ha it's, it's half and half. The DOT does not uh, um, does not uh, not have a, a policy that allows um, for any type of traffic calming that involves construction or something on the road. And, and frankly, right now we don't we don't have that either um, for for our streets. So. We could certainly take a look at uh, some options for for uh, for safety issues involving Cragmont. I don't know that uh, that actual construction of uh, speed humps and those sorts of those sorts of brakes are going to be one of the options. But I'd be mm -hmm. glad to have us take a look and see if we can't prioritize some options for Cragmont Road because there are, there you know there is there is a propensity to speed there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you have any particular, you know, this is this is what we're doing. We are we're voting on this comprehensive plan update. Uh, and, and we don't get it, just we don't vote it up or down. We can make modifications to it. And if you have a particular item in there that you would like to move to a higher priority item, 
one. Uh, mention. Uh, that's why I'm suggesting that we move this. Okay. Well, let, let's let's right, so. make sure the rest of the board knows it and, yeah. that, and that we can agree on it. So, what was the number on that, Carlos? It is T six point one point one. T six on development development without cost to incorporate complete street design. The third of the road transportation in the red. So you wish to move that up to to a higher priority, to high instead of medium. High, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is everybody in agreement on that? Okay. All right. Then. Do you have any others that you wish to change? Does anybody else have any others they wish to change? I I have some, not in in the matrix that we've looked at, but going through the plan, I've got. Uh, some questions and some some things that I'd like to address and see if the how the board feels about them. Um, in particular, uh, I'm talking about our vision statements uh, on pages 10, 10, 11, and 12 in the introduction. Um, and I, I want to start out by saying is that uh, I want to commend both the staff and the planning board for all their hard work on it. I've been to a lot of the hearings. Uh, I know the incredible amount of public comment you got. I've read all the public comment that came with this and the in the document so I know that this has been a very labor-intensive process and uh, I have been very going through it I've been I've tried to be very sensitive about what making uh, changes or revisions because I know that you guys have diligently worked on it and uh, but the way that I look at the comprehensive plan is much like Matt described is that I, it gives us an umbrella of points for us to budget towards, to strive to, for not just us that sit in these seats now, but going forward. And I think the vision statements are the most important part of that. And in essence, I'd like to see them, and for the most part they are, be continually positive about our community. But there are a few sentences in there that I'm, I'd like to see us either modify or maybe remove. Uh, the first would be under uh, Section 1, Small Town Character and Community Identity. It's just that last sentence of it. We have avoided the ticky-tacky development that sometimes comes with undesirable growth. I'd like to see us work on a way to, to rephrase that to, to make, make it sound a little more professional than ticky-tacky. <laughs> um, mo moving on, I'd like to go to, to, to number five, which is commercial development and services. And in the middle of that, um, starting with the word we after uh, the first sentence, where we appreciate the absence of plasticized fast food and chain store architecture prevalent in so many other communities. And rather than shifting our retail to based big box stores and asphalt architecture and later empty storefronts, I'd, I'd like to see us take that sentence out and just begin the next sentence with, we have chosen to support our local merchants and maximize the use of existing buildings. I think that gets us to the same point. It doesn't call out certain businesses. I think that we're a diverse community. There's a place for, for chain restaurants, for, for chain things. Maybe not in downtown. I, I'm not, certainly not advocating us having a downtown like Charlotte or anything like that. But in the highway business district, these things could be useful in generating economic growth. I'd like to see that removed. Um, well, let's, then let's deal with that right now. Okay. Then, see. And let me ask What's just because I'm trying to mark you. Sorry, Matt. No, no, I'm, I'm just trying to keep up to. So you're talking about the, the sentence that says we appreciate the absence. Yes. Take you know, take that I'm out and take that, half the other sentence. That sentence out. To the just comment. start start it next with after the first sentence with we have chosen to support our local merchants after small town. Yeah. Just start there. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Everybody in agreement on that? Okay. Uh, okay. I, I am also uh, just on on. Section one, you want to just delete that last. That's sentence. what I would say. Just take the sentence yeah, out. That'd be fine. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, All right. What else you got? On number seven, housing and neighborhoods. Um, the again, the middle sentence there. Our town has moved away from trendy gated communities. Um, I, I'd like to see us just leave gated communities out of that uh, completely, and instead just say that the, the town is instead focused on. Uh, bring the town together with an open network of pedestrian and bicycle friendly streets. Okay. Fine. okay. You got any others? Right. Or is that uh, it? Just the last one on, on number 10 economic opportunity. The last sentence we see the offspring of Black Mountain residents uh, finding excellent career opportunities in the community. 
I'd just like to take offspring, the offspring out of that. I'd like to see residents, not just in the future, but now find those opportunities in this community. And I think that should be our goal going forward. We see the Black Mountain residents. We see Black Mountain residents finding excellent career opportunities in this community. Okay. Any other changes or priorities or deletion or, or additions if somebody wishes to make them? Um, just, just one other thing. In Chapter 4, when we talk about the Greenway Network, um, when we talk about the, the Flat Creek spur and the, the trail there, um, I was hoping that we could add some consistency and instead make that the Emily Russell trail throughout. Okay. When we, when, in reference to the existing portion of Flat Creek? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. The whole trail? Mm -hmm. uh, While we're on Chapter 4, uh, I, I would like to see that we go ahead and, and, and remove, if you look at page 9, Chapter 4, okay. look at the bottom there underneath the, uh, not the bullet, but the, the square black box there. The extension of the river walk north under the railroad trestle along the Swanwell will require the removal of an abandoned sewer line. That's done. That's history. Jerry, Jerry Vihan and us, we got that done about four years ago. Okay. So that that needs to come along off. Just we'll require the removal of an abandoned sewer line. That's that's out of there. That's how we got our uh, no, or no, no rise certificate. It's it's probably a little bit too early to go ahead and, 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 and because the Greenway Committee needs to needs to do this, but I'm, I'm just going to mention this. It talks on page 10, the bullet point there, the open bullet point. Phase two of the Flat Creek Trail will extend the Greenway north along Flat Creek, eventually linking it to the trails of Montreal. Well, it has. That's what it's doing now. It's going up to, to Cotton, Cotton Creek. Mm -hmm. But more than likely, if we were to try to extend that from Cotton Creek to the Montreat Gate, if we go along the river, we will encounter more partials in that one section than we have in the entire Greenway section. And so that we need to be thinking about that. Probably the best thing to do is just to go up and put, put a sidewalk up on the uh, Flat Creek, the gate. But anyway, that's something we can do later. But it doesn't, Any, it's pretty broad there, though. I mean, because it just yeah, says extend the Greenway broad, North. Yeah, I'm, I'm so probably, we got to do it. I now. think it still gives you some flexibility within that, though. Anything else we need to change before we vote on this? Um, well, this is these are just minor things. Um, in Chapter Seven, Economic Development, page fourteen, Figure Seven Seven, uh, we need to get a, an updated conceptual plan of Town Square. Oh, is yeah. there? Okay. Yeah, there's there's one that still has the yeah. marketplace pavilion. Maybe we'll, on there. Maybe we'll just put a, a, a yeah. space in there and let it be there a, you go. a floating <laughs> plan. Okay. All right. If I. If there's no other corrections on that or additions, deletions, I, uh, I'm asking for a, uh, a motion to accept the, excuse me, to adopt the updates to the Town of Black Mountain on the comprehensive plan as presented. Again, well, I was going to wait. Let's see if Lorraine has that on this. As amended. Yes. And, let, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to, I've written down the amendment. Can I just, can I just list? Can I just list the amendment so I make sure I know what I'm talking about? We're going to we're going to increase the priority for traffic safety um, from medium to high priority. We're going to make the, the changes as amended to the to the visioning section, um, and I I mark those down. I just the taking the, some of the sentences out, but I've got those. Uh, we'll change the references to Flat Creek to the Emily Russell Way, 
we'll take out the reference to the sewer line because that's under the trestle because that's been done and we will update the town square design on page 14 of the economic development section those are the change those are the changes that i've that i've noted is that those are the amendments yes okay and again as matt said at the beginning this is this is our guiding document you know back when this was passed in 2004 when will was leading leading us through this what happened was is that we spent so much time on it that everyone got so tired of it that we just put it on the shelf <laughs> and we didn't do anything with it for several years so i think we need to use this each year at budget time absolutely i through. okay all right a motion to 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 accept the uh, updates to the town of black mountain as amended i'll make that motion okay. all in favor aye uh, opposed very good thank you Communication from staff. Sneed. I have nothing. Matt. Um, no, I've given most of them. I will, I will uh, just point out quickly we've got interviews for the planning director position scheduled for Thursday and Friday this week, and I'll be updating as soon as I can on that. Yeah. Uh, do we have communication from the Board of Aldermen to the public? I have one thing I'd like to say, and that is at the end of Lake Tomahawk, in between Lake Tomahawk and the Croquet Court, uh, for anyone that's been by there, no matter when you go by, we have ourselves a little river over there, stream. And it is not, has nothing to do with a broken line. It's just a natural spring. I would just like to throw out the idea of possibly getting with some, with recreation and stuff, to make that into a wetland garden. I mean, it seems like that would be- We've actually taken a look at, uh, and it's just been too wet to do anything to it, I think I would ask Jim, I think we've, uh, we've, we've planned to uh, do some French drains in there to try to, to get it to dry out some. It's just stay tuned. I, I can understand. I, and, and I know that that's what Jamie talked with, I mean, uh, Casey and I talked, talked about too, uh, Jamie. But we got a perfect opportunity here to have a wetland garden. Very few places are, have that ability because you don't have the water there to do it. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out as a, as, a, as something to talk about. Uh, I just want I shared this story at the agenda meeting, but I, I wanted to share it with everyone that's in the room now as well. Um, this past week, Michael and myself, we were able to attend uh, the newly elected leader school provided by the, the School of Government and the League of Municipalities. And as I was sitting there, I was uh, in between breaks, I was, I was reading my a comprehensive plan with uh, my, my table mates from the town of Canton and they were so impressed with what our staff and our community had done that they actually took my original copy so that they can try to implement something in their town so I think that says a lot about uh, the quality of people we have serving on the boards here the quality of people we have serving this community and it's it's just a from my perspective it's an honor to, to get to work with those folks and uh, they should be congratulated for all that they do well, and we also have uh, a member of the board that was that was present at the time, uh, and um, we certainly appreciate the people Will Kennedy who led us through that through that time, and Mary Leonard Very White, nice, yeah. who was there, and we appreciate all of what you did on that. So, do I hear a motion to go into closed session? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh.